Hi, everyone. So this lecture is on the clade Extazozoa, which includes nematoda and arthropoda. So remember that this group is uh, part of the bilateral animals, uh, but they branch off into the protostomes, right? And so um, remember that the protostomes also split between Lophotrochozoa. So these were the groups that had a trochophore larvae or a lophophore. A ring of cilia at some point in their development. But extazozoa, this is the group that produces a cuticle, right, that is molted, right? Uh, so a cuticle is a non-cellular body covering, uh, covering the epidermis and is secreted by the dermis as well. So being non-cellular, it does not grow. And so they have to shed or molt it in order for the body to grow. It um, produces a little extra support and protection, right? And then uh, usually there's some developmental options going on, which is called metamorphosis. We'll see that more in the arthropoda. Uh, so there are two phyla within this one, uh, nematoda and arthropoda. So we'll see that um, more in the arthropoda. The metamorphosis. Uh, but this grouping of the extazozoa has been supported by many types of data, um, including molecular data. So the structural data and the molecular data, remember these are two different data collection that are not dependent on one another. In order to understand the molecular data, you don't need the structural data, right, and vice versa. Um, so that means that's independent confirmation. It means that the grouping that was developed by the structural data, if it's supported by the molecular data, that's independent confirmation. Okay. Um, the other thing though to realize this is not a monophyletic group. It's uh, evolved from more complex animals and this then developed into a more simplification of the body plan. Okay, so let's go with the first phylum. This is a more simple phylum, uh, nematoda. These are characterized, these are known as roundworms, right? So nearly all of them um, are from habitats from the poles to the tropics, so they're everywhere. They have really important ecological roles as decomposers, and they can also be predators of other uh, small organisms. So, um, and then many soil nematodes actually eat bacteria. So again, after learning about ecology and all the interaction, here now you're, we're putting specifics onto that, okay? Uh, and so again, they, they form that tough cuticle and that's that kind of that clear edge that you see on the end. Um, and it's made of collagen, so that's a protein fiber. It's not a cellular, it's not a cell, cells grow, okay? Uh, and the other thing to remember about nematoda is they are pseudocelomate, so they have that false ca uh, cavity, it's lined by, uh, mesoderm on the, on the um, uh, excuse me, external side of the coelom, and it's only endoderm on the internal side, right? So this would be the muscle, the mesoderm, okay? So pseudocelomy. Um, nematodes also have muscle, a uh, skeletal muscle that uh, lays down along the length of these worms, so it's called longitudinal muscle. They don't have muscle that wraps around the worm like the annelids did. That helps the annelids with much more efficient movement. For, for the nematodes, um, the pseudocelum acts as that hydrostatic skeleton. And so when they do contract their muscle, it's the force of contraction against the fluid that causes movement. And then this movement of fluid is also really important in nutrient transportation and distribution as well, because they lack any structures for a circulatory system. Okay. And then the stylet, I mean my laser, the stylet is this structure here that's adapted for piercing uh, cell walls. And so it usually functions in providing uh, the organism with access to nutrients contained within the, the prey of the, the cell of the prey that they're going after, right? And they do have a complete digestive tract. It, it starts with the stylet up front that surrounds the mouth, 
Um, reproduction is usually sexual. It's separate in males and females. Um, they do have internal fertilization. So on the purple picture there, you can see uh, all the eggs that are filling the body of that female, and the ovaries, things like that. Um, C. elegans is, uh, uh, you can just shorten that to C. elegans. That's what everybody calls this specific one in the, on the left there in the blue picture. It's a free living soil nematode and it's just important in model research organism for studying genetic control of development and things. So a lot of what we've learned about Hox genes and other things is from C. elegans. Um, <clears throat> so again, a good model organism. Uh, they tend to be pointed at both ends. And again, you can, you can see that cuticle uh, in some, some portions more than others, so that tough, flexible cuticle. Uh, it just helps them to give their body shape and protection from the environment as well. Okay. Uh, a large number of species tend to be parasitic in humans uh, and other vertebrates. And so I think I go a little bit more, um, the, uh, W. bancroferi, they, um, that's a species that can get into the lymphatic system of humans and uh, uh, clogs up the lymphatic vessels. I actually have that um, life cycle here. You can get injected. So it's the um, mosquito that carries the eggs and when it bites you, it injects it into you. And then those can develop then and get into your lymph system, which is a fluid system. And then again, when it clogs it up, it doesn't allow um, uh, you'd absorb the extra fluid in your tissue so it causes edema, right? And the life cycle continues. So it needs two hosts in order for the life cycle to continue. It's actually pretty easily uh, treated, but we see it a lot in third world countries because they tend to not have access to med medicine. Um, so we do see it more, but it is, it is highly treatable, right? Ascaris is a um, parasitic worm that's uh, found in, in humans. Um, hookworms tend to attach to the lining of the intestines and suck blood. That can cause tissue damage as well as blood loss. And then pinworms are most commonly found in children. Children tend to touch their rear ends and also touch their mouths. And so that's a way to get pinworms, right? <laughs> um, uh, this is uh, Ascaris. Um, just showing that the different male and female sexes, so you can actually identify uh, the, the different male and female sexes. Um, let's see, a mature female can produce as many as 200,000 eggs per day. <laughs> Incredible. And so she does that. You can see um, a lot of the organs. So they, a lot of their digestive system is reduced because they get, being a parasite, they get their nutrition from their host. So they fill in their body with the reproductive organs. So you can see a, a lot of oviducts, uterus, uh, all uh, spread throughout the inside of the ascaris. So a type of nematode. All righty, that's, that's it for the nematodes. They're pretty simple. Um, phylum arthropoda is very complex though. It is the largest phylum of animalia. They're very successful. So here we are, we're going, they're, they're one of the bilateral organisms. They split, go along the protostome side. They are not lophotrochozoans, they are extozoans, and so they are their own phylum separate from nematoda. All right, so I said they're very successful. More than 80% of all known animals are actually arthropods, so they're extremely diverse. And they are uh, extozoans because they release their exoskeleton. So one of the major defining characteristics of arthropods is the exoskeleton. So that's even tougher than the cuticle. It lays over the top of the cuticle. And again, it's, it's made of chitin um, and it's um, non-cellular. So it doesn't grow with the animal. So in order to grow, they do need to molt their exoskeleton every so often. And that leaves them vulnerable at that time period. So this is a cicada that has molted 
And uh, so, so it would be easy for birds to eat him right now. But once he dries out and the exoskeleton hardens, then he's pretty well protected. It's harder for birds to, they can still eat them. It doesn't mean they don't eat them, but they're, it's a little bit harder for them. If they don't clamp down hard enough, then the, it can get away. Think about if you ever saw a beetle walking on the ground and you went to step on it to squish it and you lift your foot up and he just keeps walking, right? That's the exoskeleton that's helping him. All right, so there is a wide, wide variety of uh, arthropods. And so we're gonna go through uh, many of the, of the classes within arthropods. Okay, so the phylum again, about 80%, I said, of all living species. Um, and the success is really related to this body plan allowing for adaptations in all major biomes. So they've got segmentation, they've got jointed appendages, the exoskeleton. We're gonna look at all of this. Um, that's, again, really just lend to their success, okay? Uh, just a little FYI to just kind of show that some arthropod lineages have lived for a very long time, over 500 million years ago. And so they've had a long time to diversify, as opposed to look at mammals. Mammals are pretty new on the scene, and humans were just babies compared to all the rest. So there's not as much diversity in hominids, the primates and things, compared to other mammals, compared to lizards, so on and so forth, especially the arthropods. Uh, all of these are arthropods because uh, we haven't been around nearly as long. So with time, we show a lot more diversification, okay? So again, phylum arthropoda, they're protostomes uh, in the subgroup, uh, extazozoa, or you can call that a clade. And then these are the groups that we'll look at. Trilobites are an extinct uh, group. I didn't go over that in Zoom class, so it's in here. I'll just cover it briefly, but you won't be responsible for that. But trilobites are really kind of cool uh, fossils to look at. Okay, so we'll look at all of these different groups. Um, again, your, your current book that you're using, uh, the 10th uh, edition, calls these groups um, uh, phyla, or I'm sorry, um, subphyla. The 11th edition, if we made you get the 11th edition, we had let you uh, save some money. Now they're referring to these as clades. So I just want to say that because if you use other resources and you get confused, is this a phylum or a subphylum or a clade? Okay, they're being, it, it's being it's under um, review again because of the technology with being able to sequence uh, DNA and other molecules. So I'm going to use what your tenth edition said was subphyla for these groups. Okay, but for the for the group for the phylum itself, Arthropoda, the broad category, again they are segmented and they have appendages for locomotion. So they have a diverse array of appendages. They're used for locomotion. They're gonna be used, they're gonna be part of the mouth, um, mouth parts for food handling. So they're gonna be maxilla, mandibles. They're also used in reproduction. Um, and they always have a head, thorax, and abdomen. Although in some groups, some of these may be fused together. So if they're fused together, we refer to that fusion as tagmata. But for example, if you see um, the thorax, head and the thorax, that, that region then will be called the cephalothorax, right? Oh, oops, I went the wrong way. Cephalothorax, there you go. Okay, so you might see some of those, uh, that fusion occur. So here's what it looks like on a grasshopper, for example, he's got the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. So there's segmentation there. There's different body parts, okay, um, separated from one another. And you can see that you're going to see in the different groups, the uh, um, appendages will be branched off of different areas of the body, right? That's, that's a indicative of an insect. Here's a marine uh, crustacean, right? So here's, you can see the cephalothorax. So it does have a thorax and a head, but the, it's been fused together and the carapace covers that. So you only see the one thing. But here's showing the variety of appendages, so he's got little attenuals as well as a tenae, that's for sensory, 
These are the mandible and the maxillae for food handling. His, his mouth is up in there, so he can move that into his mouth. Maxillipeds also help with that. Uh, chelipeds um, is the first leg, but it might have a claw on it. It might may or may not use it for walking. Here are the other walking legs. This guy swims, so he's got appendages to help these move around to help with swimming. Um, and that, but he's also got a tail and that ends in the middle portion called the Europod with the telson on either side, just to make a big paddle so he can uh, shove that through the water and swim. Okay, so a lot of variety. And um, so this is just color coded to kind of show the different areas with that variety of appendages that they have. So many different functions. So you can see that's gonna help them adapt extremely well. Okay. Um, so uh, also in the phylum arthropoda, there's extensive cephalization. Uh, and so they have well-developed organs uh, for sensory, for sight, touch, smell, hearing, balance, right? That's going to help with a lot of adaptation. Their eyes have that compound eye. So each eye has one of these structures called an omatidium, but they have hundreds of them. And each omatidium can take light into the structure and form an image. So if this fly was looking at you, it would form hundreds of images of you. Okay, so they see things a little differently. We see things as one image, they see it as hundreds of images because of each of these individual omatidia. Okay. Uh, they have a more sophisticated brain than any of the previous uh, organisms that we've studied. So you're gonna start to see some behaviors occur and also help with the diversity. Uh, open circulatory system, remember that. Uh, for gas exchange, they may have gills if they're aquatic species, um, but if they're uh, uh, terrestrial species, they have a tracheal system with spiracles that uh, open into the environment for air to move through, or they have what are called book lungs, which are kind of like terrestrial gills, if you want to think of it that way. Um, yeah, they're like, it's like sh sheets, sheet-like structures that extend into the hemolymph. So because they're sheets and they're thin, that allows for gas exchange and to draw it into the hemolymph. So it is almost like uh, gill-like structures for the terrestrial environment. Some um, spiders, some have that. Okay, here's the tracheal system. So if you remember that when we did uh, physiology. So here are the spiracles located on the abdomen of some of the uh, arthropods. And of course, not these are only terrestrial, not aquatic, because uh, that would fill in with water. Um, and so air then is drawn through these tubes that branch and branch and branch, and they just branch to all the cells in the body. So we make um, insecticides. Some of them are fine powders and they clog these spiracles. So the insect basically suffocates. Uh, and then a complex digestive system. So remember for excretion, they had uh, malpigian tubules. Some might actually use metanephridia. Um, and so the mal malpigian tubules um, uh, uh, create the salt and the uric acid and then bring it and merge it in with the digestive system. And so salts and uric acid get excreted um, through the rectum, through the anus, uh, through the digestive system. Okay. Um, this, I, I, this is on this PowerPoint. It's not in the Canvas module, so don't, don't worry too much about this. But there is a constraint on how big arthropods can get because of the exoskeleton. Um, it's, it's not strong enough to support larger animals. And if it, was if it was larger, it would collapse down on the animal. And so molting then would also be more hazardous for larger animals, right? Also through their respiratory system, they can't get enough oxygen throughout the body. So there's a constraint on how large uh, arthropods can get. So these uh, movies with giant insects and things, uh, if anybody watched Starship Troopers, in our world can't really happen. <laughs> they wouldn't be able to come to Earth anyway. So don't worry about it. All right, so 
so out of these classes of arthropoda, I think I updated this on Canvas for you because one was missing out of here, uh, Maristomata, um, but it is in the um, PowerPoint. So make sure you, you the Canvas, I think, um, has the information that you really need there. And I didn't go over Trellobita um, in the Canvas module because you you don't have to remember that. But um, that's one of the first groups of arthropods, and it's an extinct group, but their fossils are everywhere. So they're really interesting to study in the fossil record. All right, so when they moved on to land, so we're going to have a group that's in the water and a group that's on land. Um, again, the diversity just exploded. So now they moved out of the water onto land just as plants were colonizing the land. Right, so with the plants there, that was food and habitat, and everything else. And so that presented uh, many different microhabitats so that the uh, arthropods could, um, could adapt to all these different types of habitats. And that's why we see this diversity now. The segmentation helped with that. We're gonna see uh, a very different mouth parts that help them eat different things. Right, and of course the exoskeleton just protects them and also protected them from drying out. So the arthropods started in the water and again, the exoskeleton was more for protection than those that were uh, on the coast and maybe experienced being out of water every once in a while. Um, they, they had, had this advantage of the exoskeleton just happened to keep them keep their inside of their body moist and not dry out. So again, here's that class trilobites. Oh, they're so cool. Um, they were usually about three to 10 centimeters or so, um, but they could be as long as a meter, right? Really long. There's about 4,000 fossil species. Um, and, and they're just really cool. I always like them. They lived about 500 million years ago and they seem to have died out about 250 million years ago. So they've been around for 250 million years. Uh, really, really cool. I just like them. Okay. Um, the next, so now we'll, so these are extinct. So remember that these are extinct. Um, the next one are, uh, uh, subphylum Chelicerata, but the class Arachnida. So in the class Arachnida, these are spider scorpions, ticks, and mites, and they have two tagmata. So again, the head and the thorax fuse, so that's the cephalothorax, and then they have the abdomen, right? Um, they also have six pairs of appendages, so four are what you always refer think of spiders as eight legs. So that's true, they have four pairs. The other two pair of appendages are the fangs and what are called pedipalps um, for sensory, predatory, or reproductive. Um, uh, here they are, reproductive stru structures. So the grab on to the female or whatever they need to do, right? So in the canvas, you can, there is a video I embedded there where you can look at the giant tarantula to learn a little bit about them. Okay. Scorpions also have similar body shape, ticks and mics. Scorpions though have um, a projection off the back, off of their abdomen um, for um, stinging, so for poisons. Um, and these are the only um, arthropods, the class arachnida, that don't have antennae and they don't have chewing mandibles. Okay, so again, the fang-like feeding appendages um, help them um, to suck fluid from their prey. So that's how they eat. The second appendages, again, may manipulate food, locomotion, defense, copulation. So those are the pedipalps. And then you have the four pairs of walking legs. So we all, again, we, we um, compare, uh, or we associate spiders with four pairs of walking legs, eight legs, but it's also true of scorpions, ticks, and mites. So if you see a little thing, you don't know if it's a tick. Um, again, you want to be aware because those will suck on people. You got to be careful of those as well as your dog or your cat, um, and they can have, carry disease and transfer that to you. So if you're unsure of what it is, eight legs, <laughs> right? 
oh, this is just for fun. So they do um, spiders, you know, they have unique glands in the abdomen to secrete uh, silk, and that's what they use to make um, their webs out of to capture prey. It's very strong. Um, but they've been under, they do studies on, on drugs as well and how they affect them. So this is a spider when you give him caffeine. This is what he does to his web. Um, you can see it's broken here, but normal spider web is very well constructed and, and um, normalized, right? Here's a spider on marijuana. <laughs> and so, I mean, they actually did these studies in NASA to look at just drug effects. And so usually when we can study it on a simple organism, then we can uh, see how it affects more complex organisms, including ourselves. Okay, so that's class um, arachnida. The next one is class meristomata. This is from the subphylum Turisorata. Um, they are the only um, group in meristomata, the um, uh, Horseshoe crabs are what these are called, horseshoe crabs. Um, they've all gone extinct except for this horseshoe crab, but they've been pretty much unchanged for 350 million years. So they're really cool organisms, just primitive looking organisms. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, so they also belong to the subphylum Chelicerata. I wasn't sure if I made that clear just a second ago. So two classes within Chelicerata. Meristomata and Arachnida. So Meristomata here, again, the horseshoe crab, the only extant species. Again, you can see a cephalothorax and an abdomen, um, a lot of um, variety in their appendages, but here we see book lungs, right? Same with many of the spiders, they actually have book lungs as well. Okay. All right, so that's a Meristomata. The next Meripodia or Meriapoda, Subphylum Meripoda. These contain also two classes, the Diplopoda um, and the, um, oh, I just forgot the name. I'm getting tired. I, this is like the fourth video I'm doing. Kylopoda. Wow. Um, but look at their body plan. Very different. So they have a head and then their tagmata is the, the thorax and the abdomen, which are together. Right. And so um, what we're going to see is that they have a uh, pairs of legs on each segment. And so uh, it's going to depend on the class if they have one pair or two pair, right? So in the class Diplopoda, they actually have two pairs of legs. You can see them there really well per segment. So that makes them, they have a lot of legs. So they refer to those these as millipedes. Milli means thousand. It doesn't mean that they honestly have a thousand legs but it just means they have a lot of legs because of the two pairs per segment, okay? But these are herbivorous. They don't really hurt you. Uh, you can pick them up. They won't really hurt you. They've got uh, antennae, one pair of antennae off the front. You can see that there. Um, so that's Diplopoda. Uh, the class Chylopoda are centipedes. So they have one pair of legs off of each segment. Okay, and so centi means 100. So again, they don't really have 100 legs, but just compared to the millipedes, they have less legs. But these are, um, uh, have, uh, these are carnivorous, centipedes are. Um, their head has uh, more sensory appendages. They can have a pair of antennae, um, and then three pairs of appendages that are modified as mouth parts with powerful claws that can be connected to um, poison glands. And so they can actually sting, they can hurt if you pick one of those up. So usually you wanna leave those guys alone. All right, All right. Um, the next uh, subphylum is hexapoda. Hex means six, poda means feet. So these are groups that always have six legs, right? And the main one is the class insecta. Uh, there are more species of insects than all other animal species combined, right? This is partly what lends to the diversity to uh, the arthropoda. And not all of them has wings, but those that did obtain wings were really crucial to their success. And so um, the wings are um, uh, 
just help them colonize and, and adapt to many different types of uh, um, habitats, right? So the wings are not segmented appendages like birds and bats, um, but they're just an out, outgrowth uh, coming from the um, exoskeleton there. Right, and so they're so it's not they're not related to birds and bats because they have wings. Okay, um, but they end up being very agile on the ground also because they retain all of their legs for walking. So whether they're flying or walking, they're 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 really good at both. Um, yeah, let's go to the next one because they also have a diversity of mouth parts as well which also help for their diversification. So they can exploit very different food sources on the same plant. So reducing competition among one, one another. So remember that from early in the semester. So they have sucking parts, chewing parts, lapping parts. Um, so again, all uh, just being able, these varied mouth parts just helping to specialize in feeding. So that, again, that opens them up to new habitats as well. Okay, uh, another um, characteristic of the class Insecta is metamorphosis. So they go through different stages before, from the, between the egg and becoming an adult. Okay, and so um, if it's complete metamorphosis, then they have four stages with the adult uh, and the intermediate stages are four stages before the adult. So those intermediate stages are called larval stages and they look very different than the adult does. So that's what you see here. Here's the egg. And when it divides, it will then form the larval stage. And there are the four stages. And you can see uh, some of these look similar to each other, but they all look so different from what the adult does. So to go from this body plan to this one, okay, they, they go through the, uh, a period of uh, in the pupa stage. Okay, so it's in the, the pupa stage where the body then it goes, um, it goes inside of there and it, there's just this incredible release of hormones that completely reorganizes the body structure from this to this. And again, this is just an example of, um, of uh, 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 excuse me, of um, ladybugs, but uh, you can, I have on canvas, you can see the transformation of uh, butterflies as well, and all different types of, of species do this. So that's complete metamorphosis. You've got the egg, larva, pupa, adult, always four stages in there. Okay, egg, larva, pupa, adult, as well as the larval stages, there's four within there. Okay. Um, the adult stage is the reproductive stage. The larval stages are the eating stage, right? That's mainly what they do. And then there's incomplete metamorphosis. So some insects go through incomplete. So from the egg, when it develops the larval stage, we refer to those as the nymph stage, right? Or instars, because they look like pretty much like the adults. So if you come across a nymph, you can probably identify it as the adult. Right? But if you come across a larva from complete metamorphosis, you might not realize that this, you're looking at a ladybug because we know that this is what ladybugs look like. Okay? Um, so the change is just more gradual. It's not that extreme change. So you don't have the pupa stage here. So with that more gradual stage, you don't have that dramatic transformation. So the nymphs just kind of grow and feed, grow and feed. They shed their exoskeleton several times. And then each time they enter a new stage of growth, which is called a, a new instar. Okay. Um, so there you go, that's insects. The other thing about insects, some of them have, again, a real complex social behaviors and communication. So like ants have developed these big social colonies where they all work for the colony. Honeybees as well. Honeybees even have little dances to help communicate with one another. So honeybee can come back to the hive and it does a little dance, it's called a waggle dance. And that waggle dance tells them where to find uh, nectar resources and pollen resources. And it does it by orienting itself with the sun. So uh, it's like honeybees have a compass 
where they can find where that honeybee had been before. Really interesting communication if you want to look into that. Um, and then the last one is uh, the subphylum crustacea. Okay, and so these are mainly marine. Looks like I, there we go. Uh, very diverse as well. You got crabs, lobster, shrimp, um, barnacles. Uh, isopods are terrestrial, so most of them are marine except for isopods. These are the terrestrial. Um, many are primary consumers of algae and detritus. Some of them even, they're so small, they become part of the zooplankton that floats around in the water, mic almost microscopic. And so um, with the um, crustaceans, subphylum crustacean, again, extensive cephalization, sophisticated brain, you've got open circulatory systems. Most of them have gills. Some of them have book lungs. Um, here's the body, the, the very diverse body forms. So you can even, so here's just, I give you an idea of the crab body form. Um, again, the carapace kind of covers what's the head and the um, abdomen and the thorax and many of those get fused. Okay, you can see the variety of walking legs as well. Okay, as well as uh, antenna, mouth parts, um, even some for um, defense or display. So some even display to other males so that they can have rights to fertilize the female's eggs. It's usually external fertilization, All right? So there's um, this one, uh, many of them, like I mentioned, become part of the uh, zooplankton. So these are very tiny. Some of them are microscopic, copepods, krill, amphipods. Um, and some of the biggest animals on earth eat those tiny little animals, right? They have a lot of energy. These little animals are part of, uh, at the lowest levels of the trophic cascade, right? These are at the highest levels. So these are eating, uh, or these, these organisms are eating at the levels where it has the most energy, right? We lose less energy, okay? Blue whales, the largest mammal on earth eats these guys. So one of the things that characterizes the subphylum crustacea is the Nopolis larvae. Okay, so the Nopolis larvae, again, another stage uh, um, of, of uh, metamorphosis uh, looks very different from the adult. So that's what crustacea are classified as. Okay, so here we'll go through a few classes. So the first class under the subphylum crustacea is copepods, copepoda. Copepods are the most abundant crustaceans. Usually they're microscopic. Again, they're the most numerous component of zooplankton. So filter feeders end up eating this. They're a very important part of the food chain, okay? So they're not primary producers, right? Because those would be then along with the plankton. So these guys probably eat plankton, okay? That are autotrophs. These are still heterotrophs being animals. Class uh, Chiripedia, these are barnacles. And so barnacles secrete uh, by, they do this themselves, they secrete this limestone covering and it attaches to, um, it could be, it could attach to the hull of a boat, it can attach to piers, it attaches to rocks. Um, and there's one species in particular that attaches to gray whales. And so all they do is as the water passes by, they stick their legs out and they filter feed. They pull the water toward their mouth parts uh, and they eat and that's what a barnacle does. Okay. Um, class Malacostraca, this is the most diverse class. It contains uh, lobster, uh, crabs, shrimp, even the variety of shrimp are different, also includes krill. Um, uh, part of the zooplankton. It includes freshwater crayfish, and there are also freshwater crabs. So here you're seeing a lot of behavioral differences too. Remember, it's a little bit more sophisticated brain. So you're going to see some behaviors as well as the uh, using color and things for attractiveness. Uh, here's the body. You saw this already, but here's the body of a typical Malacostraca. Um, and so again, the order of appendages, 
you've got antennules and antennae. So these are going to be sensory. So it's usually touch and chemical, right? And then you have um, some of the appendages form the mandible and the maxillae. And these help with manipulating food toward the mouth. Maxillipeds help to put, bring the food toward the maxillae and mandibles, right? Um, then you have uh, walking legs. So they can, can uh, walk around on the bottom of the, the, the sea floor. Okay, and they may or may not have a claw. Uh, and then those that swim, they have swimmerettes. Okay, and uh, they're able to move around also in the water with their swimmerettes. Okay. That's it. That's it for uh, Arthropoda. Again, I think um, there's a lot of good information on the, um, on the actual, um, uh, Canvas container. So please make sure you look at that as well uh, and follow along in the study guide. You can see it's getting really dark. So I'm out of here. Thanks, guys.